good morning to each one of you. How are we doing so far this morning? Good. If you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to pull them out. We're going to be in uh, the book of Acts once again today as we continue to step through uh, the Jesus life and as it's lived out by the early church. And so uh, we're going to be actually starting the last few verses of chapter 4. So that's where you're going to want to be, Acts 4. Uh, as we get going today. Before we step into it, let me say a word of welcome to those joining us in the chapel. Always great to have you guys uh, tuning into us when we come to God's Word together. And also, let me say a word to the men uh, here for a second. Uh, if you have not signed up for men's retreat, let me encourage you, please, to do so. Here's why. Uh, Dr. Harv Powers uh, is, I, I, would, I, I wouldn't say he's a friend of mine. He probably wouldn't let me say that that we're actually friends. No, maybe he would. Uh, Dr. Powers was uh, a professor that I met in my doctoral program at Denver Seminary, and he had the most profound impact on me throughout that entire course of study. Uh, Dr. Powers is a tr psychology, psychologist by training, but also uh, um, deeply rooted theologically. You, if you go to this retreat, uh, this will not be a shallow fluff time. This will be a deep enriching time for your soul. Trust me. Uh, as I said, I, my first course was with Dr. Powers, and every time I went back for my courses, the rest of the time, I always called him up and said, Let's, can, will you do breakfast with me again? And I spent as much time with this guy as I could. So I would encourage you, please uh, clear your schedule. Make this happen. You will not regret it. All right? He's not... I, I, can I be honest with you for a second? Uh, bless his heart for sending us the video promo promoting his, you know, what he's going to talk about, but he's not that great on video. <laughs> uh, please don't let that distract you, all right? Go meet with him, with all of us together at Zephyr, and uh, I think the guys are out there. Are you guys signing up today? Okay. Uh, out at the men's ministry table. All right? Uh, the late Brennan Manning. You guys know Brennan Manning? You heard Brennan Manning? Oh, you need to write that name down. Some, you, not very many of you shook your head. Brennan Manning, you need to write that name down. Uh, born in Depression-era New York City, served as a Marine in the Korean War, was later ordained as a Franciscan priest. He joined a religious institute in Europe committed to an uncloistered, in other words, they're not living together uh, at a monastery, an uncloistered, con contemplative life among the poor. In the 70s, Manning began to confront his serious drinking problem. He had developed this drinking problem down under the public layers of his life and ministry. He voluntarily entered a 28-day treatment program. I believe, personally, the Christian world has been forever impacted by Manning's recovery as he went on to author several Christian books and was in high demand as a conference speaker on the transforming power of God's love. If you want your soul to be moved, search out a few of Brendan Manning's talks on YouTube. You, you won't be the same person after you've, you've listened to Brendan. One of his more famous books was entitled Ragamuffin Gospel. In that book, Brennan recounts a story of his days in the treatment center. Early on in the treatment program, they had to sit in a circle with a leader and tell the truth to themselves and to the other people in the group about the extent of their drinking. So they went around the circle and they all told the truth except for one business guy named Max. When it came time for him to reveal the extent of his drinking, he said this, I never really drank that much. They said, Max, you're in an alcoholic treatment center for a month. You weren't sipping Cokes. <laughs> Tell the truth to yourself. Admit it, he said. I'm being honest with you. I've never really had that much to drink. Manning explains that all of the guys who were in the program signed affidavits to be able to get information. Max had signed one too. So the folks working with them could glean information in any way they desired. So they had a speakerphone in the center of the circle that day, and the leader of the group said, I'm going to call the bartender closest to your office and find out. 
So they called the bartender, and the, and the leader says to the person on the phone, do you know Max so-and-so? The guy says, oh, like a brother. He stops in here every day after work and has a minimum of six martinis. This guy drinks like a fish. He's our best customer we have, a prolific consumer of alcohol. The rest of the people in the group all looked at Max. And here's a moment of truth. Max tells the truth to himself. He says, okay, okay, I've, I've had a lot to drink. A little later on in the group, they asked everyone, have you ever hurt anybody, a friend or a family member, while you were drunk? Some people said yes, and they described it. Other people said no. They, they tried to get at the truth. As, and, and, and if that was the truth, that was the truth. They got all the way around to Max, who says, I would never hurt anybody. Not even not when I'm sober, not when I'm drunk. I have four lovely children, and, I, I, and, I, and I, a wife I love. I'd never hurt my wife. I'd never hurt my kids. Leader says, you know, Max, we don't believe you. We're going to call your wife. As soon as Max's wife starts talking on the speakerphone, Max starts breathing heavily. He knows something's coming that he's been unwilling to face. Leader says, Mrs. So-and-so, has Max ever mistreated you or anyone else in the family when he was drunk? And she said, well, yes, he has. It happened just this last Christmas Eve. He took our nine-year-old daughter shopping on Christmas Eve, bought her a new pair of shoes. He was a generous man. On the way home, our little girl was sitting in the front seat enjoying her new shoes, and Max passed the bar and saw the cars of some of his buddies. He pulled in. It was cold, wintry day, 12 degrees with a high wind chill. He made sure all the windows were rolled up snugly. He left the car running so that the heater was blowing, and he said to his nine-year-old daughter, I'll be right back. You just play with your shoes. I'll be right back. He went in the bar, started drinking with his buddies. He didn't come out of the bar until midnight. In that time, the vehicle had shut off, and the windows had become all frosted over and locked up tight so she could not get herself out of the car. When the authorities opened up the car and rushed her to the hospital, she was so badly frostbitten that her thumb and forefinger had to be amputated. And her ears were so damaged by the cold that she'll be deaf in one ear the rest of her life. The wife describes this to the group, and Max falls off his chair and starts convulsing on the ground. He just couldn't bear telling himself the truth about what he had done. He couldn't face it. He was going to live the rest of his life in some sort of fantasy world of denial about what he had done. Friends, isn't the poisonous power of deceit, denial, and pretending stunning? They are poisonous to our relationship with God. They're poisonous to our relationship with others. They're poisonous to our relationship with ourselves. Deceitfulness, friends, always poisons and pollutes the blessings that God has provided in our lives. The good that he wants to give us, it always pollutes it. Today in our story in Acts, God makes a dramatic point about how much he values truth and honesty because of the negative impact it can have on all our relationships. To set the context for our story today, let's pick up, as I mentioned, uh, in chapter 4 and review where Sam left off with us last week. Look at chapter 4, verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, 
the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now let's pause there for a second. Luke sets the backdrop for our story by reminding us that the believers were experiencing a very unprecedented, profound unity. A unity that was being expressed by unhindered generosity in all things. If you want to know how powerful the Spirit is working in someone's life, follow the money. <laughs> Remember what we have been seeing with these believers. The Holy Spirit had captured them. Remember? Filled them. Captured them. And they were reveling in all sorts of amazing demonstrations of the power and favor of God. A, a, a profound. The Spirit of God had washed through them and was empowering the Jesus life in them. As individuals and, and now together as the community of the church. They were extending to one another in the same gracious way that God had extended to them. It's a beautiful thing. A.W. Tozer said, if your faith doesn't make any difference in your life, it doesn't make any difference to God. <laughs> Barnabas was a great example of the unity and generosity God intended. Look at verse 36. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field. And he brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. See, there's a classic example. As healthy now as the community was, and as influential as the Spirit was in many of their lives, we learn as we turn into chapter 5, things were not perfect. Remember a few weeks ago when I spoke about the powerful internal conflict that we all experience when we're on the road of transformation because we have two powerful competing influences in our lives, godly desires and godless desires. And, when, and that is a battle we all face. And when we give in to the godless desires, we poison the good God wants for us. Let me show you a classic example of this, chapter 5, verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? In other words, you fully owned it, right? Free and clear, yes. And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? Didn't you have all the cash? Yes. What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard about what happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Good grief. You see, in contrast to the generosity that many like Barnabas were demonstrating, 
Ananias and Sapphira only wanted, it seems, to pretend to be generous. They conspired together to deceive the others by selfishly misrepresenting their generosity. Now, please realize, let's make sure we're on the same page. They were not obligated to sell the property. They, nor were they obligated to give the whole amount. This is not trying to teach a universal principle regarding Christian stewardship, like true Christians will sell all they have and give it to the church. That's not, does everybody take a big deep breath of, <sighs> we're sure where you're going with this, pastor. That's not the point, okay? <sighs> Instead, the two voluntarily pledged the whole profit. They gave the impression that they were giving the whole, but then came with only part of their profit, claiming it was the whole. What is that? Deception. You see that phrase there in your Bibles that says, kept back? See that phrase? He kept back some for himself. That is a very rare Greek verb used to describe their action of holding back part of the money. The verb literally means to pilfer, to purloin, to embezzle. Think about this. By definition, one does not embezzle one's own, one's own funds. You can only embezzle someone else's funds. Okay? In this instance, they withheld monies that they had committed to the common Christian fund. Now that's a sobering truth for us. To think that when you and I withhold what God has provided for us, resources we understand we are to give to the kingdom work and the work, God's kingdom work in the world, we are in effect stealing or embezzling from God. That's sobering. That's clearly Luke's point of what's happening here. They had committed that to God, and then they withheld it. They knew it was to go to the church fund, the Christian fund, and they withheld it. Who knows what Ananias and Sapphira's motivations were? I mean, maybe they hoped to, you know, look better, more generous, more spiritual. We like to do that, don't we? We like to look more spiritual to others. Maybe that's what happened. Perhaps they allowed themselves to fall into the temptation that all of us have wrestled with, the temptation to believe that while God has taken care of us up to this point, we, we're not sure if he'll be faithful in the future. So we better hedge our generosity a little bit and keep some of our tithes back for ourselves. It's a trust issue. See, fundamental trust issues like this can motivate us to withhold from God. He's, he's blessed us, and maybe we believe in our heads that he'll take care of us, but in our hearts, we're, we've got some grip, we're gripped by doubt. And so when it gets right down to it, we withhold. What's clear is, is that Ananias and Sapphira tried to deceive the leaders and the others who were part of their gathering. But Peter tells them that the, the people are not the only ones they were deceiving. The one they were most tragically deceiving was, in fact, the Spirit of God. The one who, remember, Remember what we read in chapter 4? The one whose life-giving power had created the community and was residing in it, filling it, unifying it, and empowering it. That was the greatest offense of all. It's clear from the shocking outcome of the story that deception is a deadly, serious matter. Here's why. Deception works to poison all your relationships. Your relationship with God, your relationships with others, your relationship with yourself. Let me, sh let me show you what I mean. Peter says their deceitfulness, notice, 
tested the Spirit of the Lord. You see that? In other words, they tested God's patience and forbearance by deceiving and lying and think that it would be no big deal. Victimless, they think. Now think this through with me. When you attempt to deceive other believers in the body of Christ, think about the ripple effects of this. When you attempt to deceive other believers in the body of Christ, you offend your relationship with them, obviously. That's, that's pretty obvious. But you also, according to Peter, you offend God's spirit that resides in them. And also, you grieve the Holy Spirit that's at work in you. You're grieving His work in you. You see, in this way, deception poisons your relationship with God, with others, and yourself. This is a big deal. Truth and honesty are so fundamental, friends. Unless you are willing to tell yourself the truth, unless you're willing to be truthful with others and, and, and with God, <laughs> unless you're willing to be truthful in all of those relationships, you're stuck. You will be stunted, listen, you will be stunted in your emotional and spiritual growth without a commitment to tell yourself and others the truth, you will never experience the healing and freedom from your hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Lying and deceit keep you bound up, keep you in bondage, and it inhibits the free working of the Spirit of God in your life, and it's a very dangerous path. And if that's not tragic enough, when deception is at work within a, a church community, within the relationships and the gathering of church community, there's another victim that we don't sometimes think about. The victim is the unsaved world. You see, when deception poisons relationships within the church, it poisons our impact with those outside the church. Think about this, friends. Think about the number of times sin and deception within the church has made a mockery of her witness in the world. If you're unfamiliar, just go back and do some research in the 80s. Early 90s. It's classic examples there. Is it any wonder in this scene that we're looking at today, in this story, is it any wonder that just when the church is getting her legs, that God judges deception so radically? Guys, here's an important takeaway for each of us. Since deception is so toxic, we should never just trivialize it in our lives. We must never just compromise and trivialize it in our lives. Someone once calculated that each of us tells several lies a day. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Each of us tells several lies a day, yet we believe ourselves to be honest, truthful people. We have sort of numbed ourselves to it, and so we don't notice it a lot of the times. But when people are brutally honest, they admit that it's easier to call in sick than go to work when friends or family uh, are vis in town visiting. Few people think twice before insisting to the arresting officer that they were not driving as fast as he claimed they were. Most errors on tax returns occur in favor of the taxpayer. <laughs> Just saying. It's attesting to our habit of nudging reality in our own direction. The marriage counselor who interviews each partner separately in a marriage can hardly believe he's hearing the same about the same relationship because the stories are so different. 
More specific to our text for today, it seems that the sin of Ananias and Sapphira continues on today. In research conducted by George Barna and published on the Good Steward website, it was discovered that more, more Americans claim to tithe than actually do. 17% of adults claim to tithe, while 3% actually do. See, left unchecked, untruths and deceit will poison your life. It, 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 it's, it, it's just, that's the way it is. It's what lies and deception do. It's going to devastate your relationships. It ends up corrupting your character, eroding your spiritual sensitivities and likely will end up choking out or restricting the free operation of God's power in your life. So we've got to commit, friends, to being honest and forthright in all areas of our lives. We must commit to being honest with ourselves, honest with God, honest with one another. We have to seek to help. We have to seek the help of others in our lives. The help of others to help us get real about our blind spots and our self-deception. Like Max in our opening story. Jesus said, "If you hold to my truth, it will set you free." In the end, Ananias and Sapphira played a deadly game of pretending. And it shocked everyone who heard about it. And verse 11 tells us that everyone who heard about this had a, literally, a healthy new respect and awe for God. You think? <laughs> That's because they learned in a dramatic way that honesty and integrity matter to God. He holds them in highest esteem, friends, because they, they breathe life into your relationships. You see the difference? Truth and honesty breathe life into your relationship with God. That's what confession's about. That's what confession's about. They breathe life into all of your relationships, into your relationships with one another. I'm not saying that you got to go back and you got to haul out all the old stuff from the past or your truth. No. But if you start to learn that stuff in the past that you've kept hidden is impacting your today, get with a trusted Jesus follower and figure that out. Some truth needs to be told. Not to everybody in the world, not in front of the church but to some trusted brothers or sisters. It's the only way you're going to find freedom and healing. Being honest and truthful with yourself breathes life into your witness, friends. Your confidence is restored as you're fully disclosed with God. No, you know, no withholds, no hiding. You realize God's got full access to you. You're not keeping anything hidden away. That's stepping out with confidence. Letting the Spirit of God work and flow through you. Now, because inquiring minds want to know, the sequel to the story of Max that I started out with this morning is encouraging. Yay. It's going to end on a high note. His deceitfulness threatened to undo everything that God had given him wife, his kids, even threatened to get him kicked out of the program. But Max pleaded for and obtained permission to continue in the program. He then proceeded to undergo, listen to this, this here's where the freedom. He, he then proceeded to undergo the most striking personality transformation the group had ever witnessed. He became more honest, more sincere, 
Notice, more affectionate, more vulnerable than he'd ever been before. Freedom. Growth. Life. Life. The tough love of God and the tough love of those around him made him stop playing the deadly game of pretending, and truth set him free, just like Jesus said it would. That's great. I love that. And the same will be true for you. As you've been listening to the lessons from the story today, are there any areas in your life where God's been nudging you? I don't know if it works that way for you like it does for me, but I I sit and I hear a message like this. God tends to turn some lights on some areas in my life that he wants to purge because he has so much in store that he wants to bless me with, that he wants to do in me and through me. So he in lovingly shines lights, lovingly turns on neon areas, turns areas in my life neon. Is that just me? Is that happening to you? Maybe God's nudging you and he's saying, it's time to be honest. It's time to lay deception aside. I want to fill you with life. Life. Health. Blessing. You're poisoning the Jesus life I want for you by holding these lies in the dark. It's time to be honest. Now's a good time to start Being totally honest with God, with yourself, with others in your life, perhaps. In our prayer time, I want to invite you to start being honest. Just start with God. Just start being honest with God on whatever issue is shining the light on. And then commit to being honest with the appropriate people in your life. Sometimes God then says, you need to go talk to so-and-so. You need to go make that right. Again, it's not hauling out all your dirty laundry. I'm not suggesting you, you know, you're hauling out all sorts of stuff you did in the past because you never told anyone. I'm not. But if you sense the God, that your the, the past is still powerfully influencing your today, the only way to freedom is tell the truth about that to a trusted friend, to God, to a trusted friend. So let's pray together. Let me invite the worship team to come back up. And I just want to settle in this prayer time a little bit. This, this is way less about what I have to say, and it's way more about what God needs to say to you and what you need to say to him. So let's just spend a few moments. Holy Spirit, we uh, invite you to fill us and to do your loving, kind tender work of growing us and maturing us and transforming us. We, we, we need you to be gentle, <laughs> but we, we don't want to shrink back from anything that you're calling us to. And if there are pieces of our lives where we're not being truthful or honest, we need to get that right. Move in our hearts in these moments. Guard us from the enemy. Guard us, Lord Jesus, from the enemy who loves to point at things and be the accuser in our lives and say, see, you're a worthless person. That's not what this is about. We ask you to rid him from the space that we might hear your voice clearly and unhindered that we might hear your voice in a way that we know, we know that's you. Give us the courage to look square at what you're calling us to look at.
Give us the courage to take the steps to be truthful and honest about where we are in our lives and who we are in the shadows. We're done playing games. We're done pretending to live the Jesus life. We need you to move on us, Lord Jesus, through your spirit. Because we've kept these things that you're pointing out for us, we've kept them hidden away because we're so afraid of what others might think or say. We're so afraid. So without your work in us, we'll go on denying. For some in the room today, the the most important truth that they have been denying is that they're sinners and they need a Savior. They need someone like you, Jesus, who's paid the price for them and has gone to the cross and endured all the suffering and the shame. You've endured all of the suffering and the shame for us. They need someone like you, Lord Jesus, who says, I'm going to wrap you up in my righteousness so that it's not about you. It's about me. We need someone like you, Lord Jesus, who says, I'm going to qualify you for heaven. And there are some in the room who need to admit that truth for the very first time. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thanks for your loving way in us. Thank you for your, your, the words of truth. Man, so, so annoyingly penetrating. <laughs> but we surrender to you. And now, Lord Jesus, as we take another step in our time of worship, of adoration, of honoring you. We do so not just with song, not just with words from our lips, but literally with the resources of our lives. You've been so generous with us. And we can get weird about it and not trust you and hold stuff back. And we be no no different than Ananias. We, we, we own that, Lord Jesus, so empower us today to be faithful once again to what you've called us to do. We release these resources to you and your kingdom work in the world. Bless each gift and each giver. Continue to minister us, we pray in your name. Amen.